I'm so happy to be here at Kubecon. Um, it's it's a uh, it's a talk after almost three years of not uh, giving any talk or any participating in any conference. So it's like a new start for me in a way. So I'm so so happy. Still nervous. Um, today I'm going to present uh, the top ten Istio security risks and mitigation uh, strategies. Um, you might have heard of the OWASP top 10 um, for webs. Um, this, is, uh, this is an idea that I came up because I, I found this uh, need in the cloud native space to have something specific to cloud native because cloud native architectures has like uh, specific problems with specific um, environments. So, yeah, let, before I start, let me introduce myself. Um, I'm Jose Carlos Chavez. I am originally from Peru, but I am based in Barcelona. I am an open source enthusiast. I participate in some open source projects. Uh, I like that. Um, I am also an OWASP core uh, co leader for the project uh, called Coraza, which is a web application firewall um, for, for the zero trust uh, times. Um, I'm also a Zipkin core maintainer. Uh, if you heard of distributed tracing, um, I'm there as well, and I'm a loving father, as you might think. Um, before I continue, uh, I want to just uh, spend a couple of minutes um, talking about how all this started, uh, because originally um, my idea was to, to build a list of awareness for um, uh, the cloud native or for Istio landscape uh, in terms of security uh, risks. But then uh, in the process, um, the security tag for CNCF got some attention on this and interest on this. So it started as a list for Istio, but in the end, we are going to make a, a top 10 list for the cloud native um, ecosystem, like including Kubernetes, Istio, or well, service mesh in general. So yeah, it's 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 growing. So uh, without further words, let me start. Um, we will first talk about what are security risk, of course, to to understand what we are talking about. And risk are something that is hard to define, or at least hard to like make concrete, right? You want to evaluate likelihood versus impact, right? Something that is unlikely to happen but has a huge impact, then it's a medium risk. Something that is uh, likely to happen, but the impact is low, then, okay, it's, it's like a, not too important risks. So what we measure usually is how easy it is for an attacker to carry out an attack in our, in our system, right? Is it easy? Is it just triggering a call? Is it a, doing a DDoS attack? Um, what are the skills needed, right? It's not the same like I write a script and then uh, start launching um, go routines that will send HTTP requests. Uh, it's completely different as if I have to get into a server and then from that server open a tunnel and then from that tunnel, SSH tunnel to open a connection to another server and then start the attack from that. It's different. And then how cheap it is, right? Because it's not the same like doing an or, or triggering an attack from my laptop uh, versus triggering an attack from a cluster. Of, of the multiple computers working together. Um, so yeah, that's, that's something we should take in consideration when we evaluate the risks. And then um, it's also important how sensitive the data or how sensitive the, the systems are like um, uh, being affected uh, for this attack, right? Because if I, if I have the resiliency patterns, let's say I have a, a, a CDN in front. I don't care about uh, whether they are attacking my web or not, right? But if I am resolving, I'm evaluating, I'm doing a database call on every request, then I'm going to pay more attention to this. Uh, also, how valuable and sensitive the target data is, right? If someone is, is trying to attack my, my, my database or steal data, um, then I have to evaluate, okay, but is this data worth it? Like, imagine people, imagine um, an attacker is uh, targeting to steal my logs, right, from the storage, then do I have PII in the logs? If the answer is not, uh, and I have a backup, it's fine. Well, not fine, but it's not that important as if I had PII in my logs that I haven't redacted. And then I will, like, uh, they, they are going to get really valuable information. And then I have to disclose the breach, right? 
Um, and then how hard is uh, to recover from that uh, attack, right? And then we have mitigation strategies, right? Which is basically how we deal with risks. Um, and this is about being honest about what is going to happen, right? Because you can assume and, uh, and accept the risk and say like, okay, this risk exists and let me assume it in, in favor of something else, right? Doing a trade-off, um, avoiding the risk because I'm not, it's not in my control to um, basically uh, fix this. So I will just avoid it, uh, maybe in a silly way, like putting a firewall in front and then I don't have to care about what happens internally, theoretically, right? Controlling the risk, like I, don't, I cannot just get rid of the risk, but I can control it. I can control the effects of it. Uh, transferring the risk, as I said, like for example, if you put a CDN in front and if you put um, something in, in front of my application, then uh, I basically transfer the risk to an upper layer, right? And then watch and monitor the risk, which is basically, I accept that this happens. I will just monitor in case this become, this get out of hands, right? So now, uh, but, the question now is, is an Istio secure by default? Like, is, is Istio, why do I care about the security risk in Istio, right? Because it's a, Istio is a service mesh, but it's also um, a software that includes a lot of security uh, features. So do I really, should I really worry about it? Or, or Istio is secure by default because it's in the cloud and baked by Google and major vendors, so it's safe to, to use it, right? Well. Uh, security is definitely something that uh, service mesh adopters look for, right? 79% of the service mesh adopters, uh, according to a CNCF survey, were looking for security. And, and then 22 believe that the most important feature that Istio was bringing was security into their applications, according to a, a solo uh, report. Um, the problem is that whenever you are adopting a service mesh, uh, there are a lot of complexities, right, that you have to deal with because it's, it, and now you have a lot of authorization policies, you have to, you have pods, you have to name spaces, like it, it's, your architecture is completely different now. And, and then dealing with that complexity usually make you push security as a second class concern. And then you just react when something happens, right, which could be too late at some point. Um, this report from Red Hat was saying that 31% of the, of the respondents were uh, accepted that they had a customer loss or a revenue loss due to a security incident in the past year. So security is, uh, the, the attacks uh, specifically targeting cloud native are in race and, uh, and really affect your revenue. So before we understand what are the risks in Istio specifically, uh, let's see what exactly means security in a service mesh, right? Because we have uh, security is uh, like a combination of multiple protection mechanisms across multiple layers, right? Security is the opposite as life, right? In life, less is more. In security, more is more, right? The more you protect, the more safe you are. It might not be enough, but still you, you do your best effort. And then uh, you have a lot of redundancy, right? Because you have to, to have different, um, let's say, fronts where if one falls down, you have another one to keep trying to protect your system, right? Specifically in Istio, in an Istio deployment, we have the underlying infrastructure, which could be the cloud, or it could be uh, an on-premise server, um, or, or a bar metal server. Um, then on top of that, you have the Kubernetes platform, which is the orchestrator of the pods, right? Where you define what are the pods, what are the services, the applications. Um, then on top of that, you have Istio Service Mesh, uh, which is basically coordinating the network, is the, the orchestrator of the network, right? How they communicate uh, uh, with each other, what, which is supposed to, co to communicate with which service and all that. And then you have the application. So you have four layers where you have to protect. And that's why it's so complex to protect uh, your deployments. Whereas an attacker just needs to find one single vulnerability, one single entry point to get into your system and then start um, attacking you from that, right? Um, so um, we should also look at what are the threat actors for these attacks, right? Because um, as soon as you identify what are the actors, you can start taking actions, right? You have first the internal attacker, which is someone with uh, probably and uh, not the highest privilege trying to uh, perform actions that, is, that are not according to their um, level of permission or, or, or their authorization. 
and tr um, push the boundaries uh, in terms of what actions they can perform, right? Then you have the contributors to Istio, which is people that is supposed to be nice and, and, and try to build the best product uh, possible, but sometimes they could try to attempt to include malicious software that can be deployed in your system and then take advantage of it, right? Probably they are the less, but uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a, a, a threat actor, right? Then you have the contributors to the third party dependencies, which is more fun because it's people that individually build libraries uh, with not necessarily a purpose of, of being used in Istio in the end. And then um, I was reading about this attack where uh, people was creating users in GitHub with one typo um, different from uh, a well-known, well-respected library. And then the attack was consisting on opening pull requests with that library maliciously, that there is only one typo so no one can detect it. And then it got merged, it got merged into Istio, it get deployed, or it get, not even into Istio, it get merged into a dependency that is a dependency for Istio. And then it gets deployed and then the attacker can take advantage of that, right? Just because of a typo that nobody will like, suspect. Um, so yeah, that's that's also interesting. And then you have the untrusted users, right? People which has the lowest level of privilege, probably outside users that try to run attacks and perform actions in your system, right? Try to find this vulnerability to get in to perform actions or to get to the host. So all these people or all these actors are supposed to um, attack you and try to get into your system and try to perform actions. But if you think of, okay, what is, a, what is truly the, the, the main threat actor when it comes to deploying such a complex system like Istio? Because it's, of course, designed to, a complex, to, to achieve complex tasks, right? And you end up in the user because misconfiguration is one of the biggest problems in security. This news is from yesterday. And I was like, not surprised because I was preparing this, but it's interesting how the human factor is still uh, a big player in this game, right? Um, so, uh, without further introduction, let's go into the into the list. Um, by the way, this list um, hasn't been prepared in an order of occurrence or frequency. It's been prepared in an order where. Uh, I was balancing uh, the impact and the feasibility of the attack based on well, talking to professionals, my experience at the trade, and all that. Um, later, I will mention the, the, the survey we are conducting about this to get like more data. So, first things first, let's talk about insecure communication. Well, it poses a significant security threat because you can have different kind of attacks if your, your communication is not encrypted or not secured, right? You can have on-path attacks, which is man in the middle, basically. Uh, someone is, is in the middle of a communication, listening for information. If it's not encrypted, then they just get everything they want. Um, you can have a spoofing uh, when, when, when a server pretends to be something else. And, and because it's plain server or, or plain traffic, then uh, Basically, they 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 can um, uh, they can listen for previous responses and then respond accordingly. Uh, credential stuffing, brute force attack because nothing is encrypted. So I mean, you can try as much as you want. Uh, nothing is stopping you. Phishing, malicious API requests, etc. And you might be wondering um, why insecure communication is a problem because Istio comes with MTLS by default and and. You have all these great features about a securing communication. Well, in security, you have this dilemma whether something is usable and something is safe to use, right? And you have to do the balance because uh, something could be really usable, but then in the end, really insecure because that's why it makes it usable, right? It, it, there is no barrier on usage. Or something is very secure, but then unusable because basically you need to deal with policies that you are not supposed to do when you are getting started, right? So Istio permissive security setting is useful because you can onboard um, legacy servers. You can try the concept of communication among, among um, components. But then uh, all data is uh, either uh, plain text or encrypted traffic. So you, can, you don't enforce uh, encrypted traffic and hence you don't enforce security. And a stricter security setting is going to 
cause that all the traffic is going to be enforced to be secure and then your legacy system won't be able to onboard into the into the mesh right causing a, a barrier in usability um, this is a very common thing because although it's really easy to enable MTLS for, for Istio, it's just an authorization, uh, per authentication policy where you deploy either in a namespace or in the system namespace to, to enforce it wide mesh, um, you will have problems by onboarding all uh, systems, right? If you, so one mitigation strategy is enable MTLS for everything, which is possible. Uh, if not, because you have legacy systems, you still need to onboard in the mesh. You can enable permissive, but then use authorization policy to restrict traffic uh, in plain text, but you can restrict who, who am I accepting traffic from, right? Um, moving to the second one, we, saw, we have unsafe authorization patterns. And this comes from the old days when people was writing firewalls, right? And, and how this concept of allow list and deny list appear. Because when you are um, writing policies and, and, and when you're writing rules, you, what, what you value the most is to be deterministic, right? You, you want to know exactly what is gonna, what am I going to accept rather than what I'm gonna not accept or deny, and then you don't know exactly what you are going to accept, right? There is no deterministic answer on what, what is possible and what is not. So this is a, a really common pattern. Um, there are a lot of, uh, even in GitHub, you can find a lot of uh, policies that are more like um, uh, uh, deny list more than an, an allow list, right? So it's not explicit what you're, what you're accepting traffic from. One of mitigation recommended by Istio is uh, use default deny for everything because um, default deny means that whatever is not uh, declared in or whatever I am not supposed to accept traffic from, I am not accepting traffic from, so I am safe in that sense. Um, allow with positive matching, meaning that I am declaring exactly what I am receiving traffic from or what I am accepting traffic from. And then deny with negative matching, which is basically the same thing, but uh, the declaration is, is the opposite, right? But in, in logically, they are the same kind of condition. I am denying, but with a negative condition, right? Those can make you have deterministic and safe policies. And then debugging a uh, security incident is much more easy. Moving forward into the third, we have weak service uh, account authorization, right? And this is one of, one of the most important principles in security is that you have the least privilege uh, principle, right? You, a user should only be entitled to do uh, the minimum amount of things that uh, let them to do their task, right? Uh, they don't need like uh, more permissions than what uh, they are supposed to do. We have many examples in Istio. Uh, the first one or the typical one is they need container, right? Uh, whenever you have a, a, a new pod, that pod is, uh, has an init container that will allow them to create uh, the, their network policies, right? That means that they have to have permissions of net admin or the capability of net admin to do so. Uh, and that poses a, a security risk because then inside the, whoever gets inside the pod will have that capabilities. Then you can bypass outbound, uh, outbound traffic policy by impersonating the Istio proxy user, right? Some containers um, have this, uh, let's say, convention or feature where you declare the user that is running the container with a user ID, right? And then that will match with the host. That's why one recommended um, mitigation is that you don't run containers as root because then someone, an attacker can mount a folder that belongs to the root in the host, which doesn't have permission for, and then from the container will be able to access those files just because the user ID matches. The same happens with the Istio proxy. People can impersonate um, the Istio proxy by using the user ID and get permissions to that, to, to, for, from, for, those, for that user ID, right? Then the third is the usage of first party yachts, right? Which is something that was uh, very popular in the past, now not anymore, but still deployments that have this, which is basically whenever the pod is supposed to, con to contact the control plane, they are using a yacht. The yacht is mounted into the pod and then the sidecar is gonna use it, but any other container into the pod could eventually use it because the yacht, the first uh, party yacht doesn't have an audience. 
One mitigation strategy is, of course, to use the, the new third-party yachts, which restricts the usage of the, of the yachts for a specific audience, so only the sidecar can use it, right? Um, a mitigation for the init container would be to use the Istio CNI plugin, which will avoid the, the, the requirements of the privileged net admin for the pod, right? It just happened. At, at, at Kubernetes level, you don't have to worry about that and you don't have to give permissions about that. This also exposed the fact that although Istio can um, attempt to be as much as possible uh, secure, it depends on the underlying platform, which is Kubernetes, right? So you cannot, uh, you cannot make um, Istio secure if you are not looking also at Kubernetes and, and, and how the policies are declared there. Later, we will see how also you, there are things you cannot achieve with Istio, but you need to achieve with uh, Kubernetes. So going to the first, to the next one, uh, we have the well-known broken object level authorization, right? The BOLA one. Um, so Istio provides authorization policies, right? To perform checks on HTTP headers, uh, on the path, uh, some Kubernetes metadata, okay, where is this originated from and where it goes to. Uh, in the services, as well as validating jobs. Uh, one of the bigger problems of this kind of authorization policies is that uh, they can access, they cannot access to the job fields, right? Where usually, because, you know, putting in, you in context, um, Istio is not uh, emitting the jobs, right? You have to have a third party service that is creating the jobs for you, and then you use it in Istio. But then the problem is that Istio cannot know every single possible field that is out there, depending on the provider. So Istio only access to the issuer and, and usually the providers put more metadata about the user into the other fields of the job, which Istio doesn't have access to or, or doesn't understand, right? So these granular policies that you might think of, for example, um, I only want uh, a team manager, or imagine you are in an HR um, system and you want to restrict that only the team manager can create users in or, or employees in their team. That kind of granularity you cannot get with authorization policies because you don't have all the concepts that you might need, right? And then another problem is that policies get out of sync with the architecture, right? There is this uh, interesting concept called Conway's Law, right? Where your architecture is a reflection of your organization. It, this is something similar, right? Because you are in a microservices world or in, in a microservices architecture, everything changes so often that uh, you cannot keep track of every change unless they are based on the same source of truth, right? Um, you write a policy, tomorrow the services change, the permissions change, the path changes, the API changes, and you basically don't have a way to keep track of that, right? Permissions, group, users, privilege. So, um, some mitigations, well, uh, first of all, um, all access decision has to be based on the least privilege principle, right? Everything should be decided per request, uh, meaning that these static authorization policies cannot resolve per request, right? Because they are more static at generic level, context-based and based on identities, right? And then one recommendation from the NIST um, is to use rich model policies like NGAC, which is the NIST standard for, for, for permissions, um, or OPA, for example, which is a well-known software, right? Where you can express policies in a more granular way with more information from the jobs, and then you can uh, do these more complex assertions about, okay, I belong to um, this group, then I am entitled to do certain things, right? And one interesting thing about NGAC is that uh, basically it's a graph, and then you can model the, um, the permissions and the users and the groups as a graph, and then it's really easy to understand what happened. Right. Uh, for example, when you are debugging a, a OPA policy, um, you fail to understand. Okay, I know this was rejected, but why exactly it was rejected? Right. With NGAC, you can basically trace the graph and say, okay, this was rejected at this point. Um, okay. Supply chain vulnerabilities. This is probably the the only one uh, risk uh, that we are mentioning that is not uh, related to a misconfiguration. Um, Istio is an open source uh, project which is based on many open source uh, components and third party code. Uh, on top of that, like Envoy and Prometheus, on top of that, Istio runs on Kubernetes. So uh, 
uh, there are a lot of uh, balls jiggling, right? So some of the risks in, uh, in a typical Istio deployment are not only the Istio components, but the, ima the images that you are deploying, right? And then uh, some of the risks are image integrity, like how do I know that the image I am using is exactly what it was produced by the user or by the, by the author? Uh, image composition, like every lawyer in the image has its own um, security risk, right? Because you are downloading software, uh, you're granting permissions, you're creating users. Uh, Non-software vulnerabilities, of course, that uh, you are not necessarily able to patch easily. Some mitigations are image scanning, like you can scan the images on um, when you are building the uh, your application on CI. There are a lot of tools like Sneak, uh, where you can uh, scan your, your artifact, looking for vulnerabilities. Um, image composition on software bills of material, right? The software bill of material is like a receipt of things that are in your image. So you can also analyze them and then uh, assert whether this is secure or not. Image signing, where you can check that the image was exactly what I is expected to be. Uh, you can have a curated registry, which is probably a composition of all these mitigation strategies where you have only an, uh, something like Artifactory where you can regularly run checks because uh, one of the interesting things about these mitigation uh, strategies and why they are complementary and they overlap is that you can have your image registry or your artifact registry and then although you are safe today, tomorrow you might not be. So you have to keep running the analysis. And then when application firewall, right, which is a, a way to protect things that are broken and you cannot fix it easily, right? If you think of, for example, in the log4j vulnerability, um, when it, or log4shell exactly, when it happened, it will happen sometime until people could actually fix it in the library and then sometime until you can include in your, in your um, application and then sometime until you can deploy that into your mesh. So, the way you can easily avoid that risk is, okay, patch the network with web application firewall. All the like query parameters that look like this in this regex, I'm going to block. So then I avoid the risk until I can properly fix it, right? Um, ingress traffic capture limitation. This is interesting because Istio, although Envoy supports some, some sort of UDP traffic, Istio proxy doesn't support UDP traffic. So all the traffic is going to bypass the, the proxy and go directly to upstream. Um, some of the inbound capture uh, is disabled on ports that are used by the sidecar, that by default. Um, so some mitigation for this, for, for UDP exactly, the, for, to, to control the UDP traffic, you, can, you need to use um, Kubernetes network policies at ingress. So you can restrict what, uh, where is traffic I am accepting, right? Where, where, is, where does it come? Um, and network policies are like firewall rules, right? You can implement a uh, namespace level, it can be both uh, pod-based, namespace-based, IP-based, and then you can uh, have uh, several policies and they will be all or, like you can apply them um, together. Uh, egress traffic capture limitation, this is similar. Um, it still cannot securely enforce all the traffic going through the, the sidecar uh, or, the, or the egress gateway. Uh, so, Technically, you could get into a pod and call uh, Google or whatever. Um, so one mitigation strategy is, of course, to use the network policy for egress. That's one. Um, egress restrictions, where you can use the outbound traffic policy, where you can say, okay, only those services that I know that are in my registry. Or another more interesting one is that you can set up alerts on uh, Linux system call events. Like you can use tools like Falco, which are constantly monitoring uh, Linux system calls. And then, okay, the, the common attack is that I get into a pod, I install curl, and then I curl a URL to get in something. Um, Falco is monitoring the system calls and then it will alert you, okay, someone installed curl in a pod. Um, someone did a curl uh, to a URL in a pod, then you can monitor this risk, right? Because there's nothing you can do else besides monitoring. Uh, okay, um, security observability and monitoring failures, right? Uh, security observability uh, and monitoring, fair, uh, monitoring are critical components of any system, actually, not only on, on Istio. Um, not having security is not only a problem in terms of how uh, you react to an attack, but also how do you understand uh, the attacks, right? 
uh, problems you have is the log level paradox. Like when you are, when you don't need the log, the log is too verbose. When you need the log, the log is too quiet. That's that's usually what happens. Is sufficient on inadequate audit logs, right? Because you don't have enough information to understand what happened. Also, um, I will explain quickly this concept where um, you keep seeing, uh, for example, failure attacks in your audit log, and you say like, oh, my my firewall is working, right? But then at some point you just don't see them, and you say like, oh, maybe the attacker just uh, surrender it, right? But what happened is that you, the attacker bypassed your firewall now. So you need to understand what happened before, and then uh, that information will let you try to understand what is happening now that the attacker is now causing more errors, right? And then lack of context, right? Because um, sometimes we, we don't have enough uh, context of what was happening, when was happening uh, for an audit event. Mitigations are ensure access log and error logs are emitted. You can enforce that on CI. You can even impose a JSON schema uh, on your logs output so you can verify that you, it has the fields that you expect to have. So you can do search and aggregation and understand everything. Um, log data should be encoded and redacted correctly, right? Because it could contain PII. Uh, I, I, there, there are plenty of tools that record the request payload and the response payload into the logs, into the access logs, into the audit logs. And then it can contain PII, and then if there is a breach, that information is exposed, right? Um, you should ensure that high-value transactions have an audit trail that you can follow what happened. That's very important. Correlation and establish an incident re and response recovery plan, right? That's also important. You really need to, to know how you are going to react and, and have a plan in place, right? Uh, number nine, vulnerable Istio versions. Uh, well, as any software, Istio being used in an older version is a, is a um, security risk because of known vulnerabilities, because it can be um, susceptible to DDoS attacks, to CVEs, to um, programming bugs where you can bypass Istio policies, cryptographic problems, failures. Um, the mitigation, one of the mitigation is of course to use the compliant Istio distribution, for example, the trade Istio distribution, which is FIPS compliant. Uh, track the CVE databases and the Istio security bulletin, so you can, you're aware of the, of the latest threats, the latest uh, security problems in Istio. And then, of course, use a web application firewall, right? Which, which is merely avoiding the risk. The, the problem with the firewall is that uh, it happens inside Istio, so it could happen before authorization, before authentication, but it still is part of the of Istio. If, so, if the attack happens before, the firewall cannot help you, right? And then, finally, number ten: What is your security risk, right? As we said, or as I said. We are, con are going to conduct a, a security report and a survey about what are the most common security incidents that people have and, and uh, adopters of, of Istio and service mesh in, in general. And, and with that, we can curate the list uh, in a way that we, it serves for everyone. Um, we are also looking for people willing to participate in the elaboration of this list. So come by the security tag. Um, we, we, we're going to be happy to, to have you there. And finally, conclusions. Uh, well, most of the security risks are related to configuration mistakes, right? Humans. Um, you always should prefer like being explicit about uh, what are your rules over uh, automatically uh, capability showing up. Um, no single component can or function will be sufficient to secure your system, right? Uh, by itself, you need a conjunction of many things to defend in the system across all layers in your in your infrastructure. And policies have to be defined based on the assumption that attacker is already inside the network, right? You, you cannot um, you can always keep defending um, the castle, right? From this, from this side of the river, you have also have to have a means to defend when they are inside a castle, right? Thank you so much. Thanks for coming.